knowing where people are coming from is one of the best ways to understand where they are. So asking questions about people's experiences that led to their views and asking questions about the concerns people have around their issues are great ways to not be so judgmental so that you can be curious. When you're curious, you actually cannot be judgmental. These are two different modes. Um, so pushing us away from judgment, back into curiosity, back into curiosity, back into curiosity, does amazing things for our relationships. This week on Forward, very happy to welcome to the podcast, Monica Guzman, the author of I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times, and the chief storyteller for one of my favorite organizations in all the world, Braver Angels. Welcome, Monica. How are you? Hey, hey. I am doing great. It's good to be here. You are on the road on your book tour. Is that right? That's right. Yep. We're heading into the third month. Uh, and, and heading all over the place. We're going to dig into to your your book, uh, but let's give people a, a, a preface first to how your book uh, tour has been going so far and what the heck's it about? The book tour has been going great. It's New York, D.C., Sacramento, Florida, universities, virtual and actual events. I love being able to go places in person. That's been really important <laughs> because people want to share their stories about how divided the country is, how it's affecting them. And they, they want to feel like there's hope. And there is. <laughs> and my book is, is partly about that. It's called I Never Thought of It That Way because when we think or say I never thought of it that way, it's a sign that some insight has landed with us because we've been exploring something a little bit different. And it feels like more I never thought of it that way moments is kind of what the whole country needs. Amen uh, to that. Uh, it does evince a level of humility, you know what I mean? Because if you say, I never thought of it that way, then it's that, oh, I'm open-minded, I'm learning something new, I'm not fixed uh, in my uh, ideas. So a, a lot of this uh, is born of your personal experience, as a lot of things are, uh, where you immigrated to this country from Mexico uh, when you were six. You are, I suppose you'd consider yourself fairly uh, left-leaning or, or, or liberal, but your parents were avid Trump voters and supporters, which is an experience that I think at least some people can relate to. Um, I will say that I have family members uh, who voted for Trump. You navigated that experience, it seemed more successfully than many. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you like continued to uh, uh, obviously, um, you know, have conversations with them and, and more, um, mm -hmm. whereas I know some folks have uh, unfortunately uh, like avoided family, that sort of thing, which I, I have to say seems like a thousand percent the wrong approach. Yeah. And it's it's a thousand percent an understandable approach, considering the anxiety that pervades everything these days when we're more scared, more stressed, more anxious. We don't want to challenge ourselves more. You know, we want to make things streamlined. And so we do what we see is happening, which is we sort ourselves to be even closer to people who are like us. And then we other the people who are different. That's, that's a reaction to so much of the fear and suspicion that's going on. And it's also understandable because, hey, these are in some cases, meaningful relationships people have. And there's a lot of pain in trying to square someone you love or treasure with an idea you think they hold that is to you abominable. So I get it, but at the same time, <laughs> to your point, I think there is so much more harm being done by in, in the not attempting, in, in, the, in the burning the bridges, instead of just leaving them there. You don't have to cross them today. You don't have to cross them tomorrow, but leave the relationships intact so that there is a chance that you can communicate across them. It doesn't have to be now, but at least it can still happen. I think your personal arc is fascinating. So you grew up primarily in New Hampshire, which is a state I know well from uh, when I campaigned. You spent a lot of time in New England, which I've also spent time in. And it's like, uh, you know, like, frankly, it's like 
not that diverse. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. the, 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 the places I've yeah. been, which, which by the way, I'm like, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm not knocking it. I'm just, you know, just his numbers. Uh, you must've had your own personal experiences uh, with, with race. And I guess I'll, I'll open uh, just talking like I'm um, son of immigrants, grew up in a town that was predominantly white, uh, very proud of uh, my, my heritage, uh, but also think that, you know, there, there are uh, a lot of things that unite Americans uh, from different backgrounds and that uh, like defining ourselves uh, solely by uh, race is not a recipe for a successful uh, democracy or civil society. Uh, I don't know if, if you had had any sort of similar experiences uh, yourself. After I was six years old and moved to New England, I was in a almost entirely white town in New Hampshire, uh, Dover, New Hampshire. I went to a Catholic school. I was Catholic myself. Uh, but, but as a sign of, you know, diversity comes in many forms. Throughout an embarrassingly large chunk of elementary school, I thought everyone was Catholic. I didn't know that there was Christian that wasn't Catholic <laughs> for a really long time because it was an Irish Catholic town. So even though I was Latina and I spoke Spanish and I had these different things in my heritage, I also shared a lot, you know, this religion with the people I grew up around that was very different from, <laughs> from other places. So that's just one example. It was, it was an interesting experience for me. I, I remember uh, the principal, Sister Monica, when I first got to the school, couldn't believe that I could count to 100 in English and in Spanish. And I think I was in kindergarten at the time. So she literally paraded me around this small Catholic school all the way up to the eighth grade classrooms just to show me off. So I, I had the experience of seeing my difference as something very special. In that community, it wasn't threatening, it was novel. And so that was my experience of my cultural difference. Uh, the other thing is, it was actually kind of a perk to be the only like Hispanics for a while in this town, at least, you know, for the most part. Uh, we would go to restaurants and uh, we'll talk about me and my parents and our relationship, I'm sure. But we had loud debates about anything. And I'm convinced that we could, we could speak more loudly than most people could get away with because nobody understood what we were saying. Oh, you're so, just going in rapid fire Spanish. I mean, sure. Sure. It was just background noise to everybody else. So, <laughs> so we turned the volume way up on our, all our political debates growing up. Wow. You started them way back then. Sure did. <laughs> Uh, you then went to college not that far from there in Maine, in, uh, in Bowdoin. Then you did some more time in New England as a fellow at Harvard. Uh, but it, it seems like you really made your mark uh, as a journalist in Seattle, where you started this uh, sort of unifying newsletter plus community events plus uh, uh, ways to get to know your neighbors and, and get engaged in new ways, which, which sounds phenomenal. You, you seem like someone who naturally rejoices in bringing people together. And like right now you professionally bring people together, which I'm going to suggest is a very important role in American life today. I, I imagine myself trying to do the same thing, probably not as successfully as you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's been awesome to, to, to feel that bridge building is a thing and that many people are doing it. You're doing it in your way. I'm doing it in mine. And we're starting to understand just how critical of a role that is. But in Seattle, I have been a journalist my whole career. And there were so many ways that it felt like journalism organizations were sort of castles in the sky, um, making decisions about what people ought to care about, but without necessarily staying plugged into the actual communities they were serving all the time. Journalism is going through a fascinating and really wonderful reckoning around this. So we've talked a lot on the podcast how thousands of local papers have gone out of business, tens of thousands of journalists have lost their jobs. Uh, so this reckoning is painful. The local news deserts in many communities, I think, are one of the forces that are polarizing us and making democracy less and less uh, successful uh, or, or, or tenable. So I'm a big believer in local journalism. And uh, it's awesome to me that you lived that for years and then just decided to try and do it a better way. And it was lovely because what I set out to show is that it's possible to start at a small scale, make sure you're connected really well to people and talking to people and then grow from there. In media, the whole thing is about scale and you get to scale and then you worry about how well you're connected. And, and instead I wanted to reverse that model and say, no, we're gonna start with connection right at the beginning. 
And, uh, and it was amazing the kinds of participation rates we had when we asked people questions, the number of stories that we did that were a result of asking people, what are your deep down honest questions about homelessness? And we partnered with other newsrooms in the city. We got 400 questions. And each of those taught us something about the fault lines in our community that we could then do our reporting to solve. So it was everything starting with people, the alpha, the omega. Everything has to connect with people or else what are you doing? How do you know it's relevant? How do you know it's helping us? Uh, so I want to retrace your steps a little bit. Um, high school, college, were you always this positive and unifying and uh, uh, the, the, like the hub of a community? Were you the sort of person that was always organizing uh, concerts and get togethers or that sort of thing? I was shy as heck as a kid. Just so I remember that I think I even wrote in the book, it's terrifying moment where my mother, we were sitting at a Burger King and she just made me go up and ask for a packet of salt. And, and I didn't want to approach another human being. <laughs> I was just too scared. But I think that what ended up changing me, I suppose, is that at some point, my curiosity about people just overtook me. And it, I was more afraid of not knowing something about that fascinating person than I was about approaching them and asking questions. And then everything just kind of went from there. And I thought, people are so darn cool. <laughs> They're always so fascinating and interesting. Why aren't we working together? What's going on? This is weird. <laughs> this isn't wow. helping us. And, and I have to say, someone like you thinking they're awesome tends to lead them to be more awesome. That's one of the, like the secrets to humanity. <laughs> I mean, it was, I think that's true. It was um, my favorite thing about journalism early on you know, it, lots of journalists have different reasons they love what they do. Mine was disappearing into someone else's story. I mean, every now and then I'd have these like moments where I'm in the middle of an interview. It's really cool to hear about what someone's passionate about, what they care about, why they work on what they work. And, and I just realized I'm almost like outside myself, just happily serving as a, as a channel for this person to discover themselves. And then for me to have the honor of being able to tell that story to their community, hopefully as responsibly as possible, so that that story can inspire, can inform, can challenge, but make sure that everybody understands what's up. So uh, at what point did you uh, discover this talent or knack of yours for helping other people tell their stories? Um, because now you are the chief storyteller at this uh, incredible unifying organization. Were you, uh, uh, like, did you run the college paper? Mm -hmm. <laughs> was, it that, was it that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it was the... <laughs> The summer after my freshman year of college, I did an unpaid internship at New, Ham New Hampshire Public Radio. I remember once I was interviewing the governor and I forgot to turn on my mic. I was terrible at the technology. I was also very nervous. I was still getting over my shyness. But there was one night where I was sitting outside of an independent movie theater that was a remodeled church. And I decided I wanted to do a feature story about independent cinemas. My big fat Greek wedding was out then. Do you remember like the yeah, independent course, cinema renaissance? So I was sitting outside that theater with the theater's owner, and he had created this theater as an incredible community hub. It was in a small town, and people loved it. And so I just, I wanted to know why and how. And I'm sitting there talking to him, and that's when I realized, this is so cool. <laughs> and, and I remember looking at him, and he was just kind of looking away. And again, sort of discovering why what he did was so interesting and getting into his own story. And I thought, this is, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to have these kinds of conversations that, that sort of help people understand what they bring and, and what they already are. Uh, yeah, that, that's where it sort of began. It was almost a, an addiction after that point. And I thought, I got to make sure that I keep doing this one way or another. Life can be overwhelming. We all know this. Often we burn out without even realizing it. That can end up being lack of motivation or irritability or fatigue or just shortness, things like that. And I want to talk to you guys about BetterHelp because it is a type of online therapy that wants to remind you to prioritize yourself and helps you just kind of work through your thoughts. Personally, I use BetterHelp. I use it a lot during COVID. I called it my steam valve just to blow off some steam, just to collect my thoughts, talk about things I don't necessarily want to talk about publicly with someone online, securely, privately, personally. So BetterHelp 
if you don't know, is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera, even if you don't want to. It's private, secure, it's convenient, easy to schedule. It's awesome. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. So really, really easy to start. So listen, our listeners of Forward Podcast are going to get 10% off their first month. That's betterhelp.com slash yang. So check it out. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash yang. Take care of your head, guys. Check it out right now, betterhelp.com slash yang. So when you started the new journalism project that was a hybrid community newsletter event uh, in Seattle, uh, how did you get the resources to do that? Or is that like a pure bootstrap type thing? So we partnered with Where By Us, which is a media startup uh, out of Miami with extraordinarily intelligent people. They had this human-centered design approach that I had heard about because I was a tech journalist in Seattle for many years, and I knew it worked, and it was very iterative and creative. And we got to apply it to even the process of researching what the publication should be. It was called The Evergrey, it, and it's still around, by the way, and it's doing great. But we asked people questions like, you know, let's say it's a year from now and you want to get the heck out of Seattle. What had to happen for you to feel that way? And then the, the, the opposite question, let's imagine it's a year from now and you've never loved Seattle more. You've never felt more connected to the city. What had to happen for, for that to be the reality? And with questions like that, before we even created the publication, we were able to kind of make a, make a map of what does it mean for people to build meaningful local lives? And that was really the driving question. What does it mean for people to have meaningful lives rooted where they are? Because we knew that the more connected people are to their city and to each other in their city, the better that city is going to be. The more investment people are going to put into whatever institutions or whatever structures, you know, the, the neighborhood dog walk, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be you go to city hall. It can be I'm in a book club. Anything that connects you locally is going to help you get more invested in making it a better place to be. Oh, yeah. I, I love the fact that people can just do things on their own, because if, if you wait for City Hall or whatnot to get itself together, you know, you might be, be waiting for a while. Be waiting for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so you won awards at the Evergrey. How did you wind up connecting to Braver Angels? Like, what was that process like? Yeah, so that was June or July of 2019. There was a conference in D.C. called the Weave Summit, uh, connected with the Aspen Institute and David Brooks at The New York Times. And so I went because they invited um, and paid for all these bridge builders from around the country to come and share best practices and talk about what we do. It was do. so wholesome. I it was, go back it was really and cool. There. I know. It's like the bridge builder summit. But uh, it was there that I saw John Wood Jr. speak. And I know that you've had him on the show. He's the national ambassador for Braver Angels. And he gave, he gave the most nuanced talk about race and division that I had ever heard. And then after a break in the conference, uh, there were these brochures put on everybody's chairs and it was for Braver Angels. And I just picked it up and went, what? <laughs> I thought this was impossible. Someone already Are did someone it. doing this work? That, that was wait, my reaction really? to what I found out about Braver Angels. <laughs> I was like, was like, yeah. do this? Yeah. So of course I just went, John, hi, I'm Monica. Hey, what's up? You know, and I had spoken at the conference too. And he's like, I love what you had to say. I was like, I love what you had to say. And it just went from there. I ended up uh, volunteering for a number of months. And then while I was writing my book, I uh, was able to join the staff and... I mean, your book like is I was home. Braver Angels. I actually thought that your book sprang from Braver Angels. <laughs> yeah, it almost seems to, right? Because, well, this is the great thing about bridge building is from all these different directions and experiences, a lot of people are discovering the exact same principles about how people work, right? As a way, as a roadmap out of this mess we're in. And uh, yeah, but like the bulk of the book was all there before I joined Braver Angels. Um, wow, it's, a, so. it's really a match made in heaven. So for people who don't know about Braver Angels, uh, it's an organization that's meant to heal cross-partisan divides. It was started in uh, Ohio, I believe, in the Midwest, uh, where they, they'd brought uh, maybe a dozen avid Trumpers and a dozen avid Democrats together and uh, tried to get them to find their common humanity quite successfully, I'm happy to say. And then it turned into a bus tour. And now it's like a million dollar plus organization with uh, thousands of donors who are trying to uh, knit us back together. 
so was that a reasonable uh, description? I, I mean, hopefully John will yell at me if that wasn't very good because, uh, you know, <laughs> well, like no you said. Well, no one articulates it quite like John. Uh, but but yeah, and we have 50,000 subscribers. We have 74 local chapters across the country. I'm actually 30 minutes away from South Lebanon, Ohio, which was the site of that very first workshop uh, right after the 2016 election that started everything. So later today, I'm going to go check it out because I've never been there. So yeah, how did you become so passionate about trying to have curious conversation? I mean, you're a naturally curious person. It seems to be a driving theme of your career. Um, uh, but the, your, your book, well, what I love about it is that it actually is practical. Um, it's born of the, you know, the experience you've had getting hundreds, maybe thousands of people to open up. Yeah, that was definitely a goal from the beginning. Uh, I had read a lot about why we're here, how we got here. It's a really interesting problem and we haven't solved it. The first part of my book is called SOS. It's the call for help. Sorting, othering, siloing. Those are the three forces nice. that brought us here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a real, you know? <laughs> but the other four fifths of the book uh, walk people through this path where first we understand curiosity and how it works in our brains. When we, when we pay attention to the gap between what we know and what we don't know, it's this incredible craving that can get us to do so much. And so you can actually turn it on. You don't have to wait for it to come up. You can turn it on and channel it and target right the things you don't understand. And then we learn the power of conversation, especially a one-to-one -one conversation. It's people are, you know, scared of them in some ways because they are so unpredictable and so powerful that it doesn't even matter almost who you are outside the conversation. In that conversation, you, you can have this extraordinary ability to cut through any divide. If you, if you know how to ask perceptive and powerful questions, if you know how to stay respectful and build traction with each other. And then, you know, the, the book goes on through a series of solutions or, you know, things to try that are based um, around a couple of core ideas. And I'll mention one of them now, which is that knowing where people are coming from is one of the best ways to understand where they are. So asking questions about people's experiences that led to their views and asking questions about the concerns people have around their issues are great ways to not be so judgmental so that you can be curious. When you're curious, you actually cannot be judgmental. These are two different modes. Um, so pushing us away from judgment, back into curiosity, back into curiosity, back into curiosity, does amazing things for our relationships. People, you know, I've learned as a journalist, people love to talk about themselves. Oh yeah. <laughs> if, it's, if it's in a generous context, they want to tell their story. Who doesn't want to be heard? Yeah, most of us love to hear ourselves talk because we're we're very wise. Uh, we have a lot to we offer. Think, we think we are, <laughs> but you know what? But but no. The, the serious point is, you know, we live in a society that that sort of still thinks, well, you know, you're only as wise as your education. You're only as wise as your intelligence. You know, you're only as wise as these things. And we don't we don't think about wisdom all that much. We all have life. We all are experts in life, and we have walked our own paths through it. And everybody's path is interesting. I, no matter what you conclude, if you believe a bunch of baloney, your path still contains a lot of truth. And so it's, so it's those things that we need to mind and, and, and look behind you know, all those places that we feel we're stuck. Look behind that to the person's path, to their story. And you'll, you'll discover pretty interesting stuff that'll help you relate and connect. Not agree, that's not, that's not the point. But relate and connect so that we can do stuff together. <laughs> no. Yeah, live together. Live together. Want to talk to you guys about a new sponsor we have called Airtable. And if you've ever tried to do any sort of leadership activity or startup, you have seen Airtable at least be offered to you as an awesome solution. In this ever-changing landscape of work, how can you ensure your people, workflows, and data stay connected? Airtable is how. Airtable allows you to create flexible systems that help your team operate as one. I've used it a few times, different orgs, and it's fantastic. So break down the barriers that leave teams feeling disconnected. With Airtable, your team works from a single source of truth that is always up to date and keeps everyone on the same page. So with their adaptable approach, everyone from marketers to product teams to podcast producers can build tools that fit uniquely to the way they work. Plus, Airtable keeps individual projects connected to your higher level goals so you never lose sight of what you're working toward. It's pretty awesome. So give it a try for free at Airtable.com today. That's Airtable.com 
to get started for free. Check it out, guys. A massively helpful tool. Now, we're at this tough juncture in American life where we need to try and knit uh, democracy and uh, our community is back together, uh, which is painstakingly difficult to do one to one. Now, what is the size of a typical Braver Angels uh, session or workshop, uh, of which I'm sure you've attended at this point dozens? Yeah, I mean, they can range depending on the workshop, as you might expect. Um, but our famous red blue workshop is eight reds, eight blues, and then moderators to walk them through the structure uh, that helps them understand each other, uh, practice humility in front of each other, which builds trust. It's an extraordinary workshop. It's been you know, studied by academics. It's been proven to be polarized. By, some, by like a marriage uh, counselor. Oh yeah, Bill Doherty, who I just saw the other night uh, and did an event with him in Minnesota. He is really, really quite brilliant and has a lot of years in marriage, marriage and family therapy where you, you learn. America you know, needs family therapy. Yeah. Amen. We well, the, you know, but the difference with America is, you know, 300 million. <laughs> right. Well, well, that's the conundrum, right? Because with America, we, we don't want to think of divorce as an option. It's not an option. And some people think it is. It's, it can't be, right? I mean, that, that's, that's what I think like faith in this project is ultimately about. Divorce is not an option. So we have to contend with each other. Uh, so his strategies inform all the, all the workshops that Braver Angels does. Um, skills to Bridge the Divide, Families Divided by Politics, the Red Blue Workshop, Depolarizing Within. Uh, we started a Skills for Social Media workshop and launched it in the fall. It's been really successful. It's a great e-course. Wait, wait, no, no, I, I have a summary. Skills for Social Media, turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do Dad, you think? How course, easy was that? that? Did. You know, I think that was one of the reasons that it sort of took a little while to get to that workshop. It's just like, well, you know, these these are not great spaces to have these kinds of conversations. In the book, I talk about five conditions for constructive conversations across the divide. And one of the most important is containment. To what degree is a conversation contained to the people participating in it? The the less contained a conversation is, the less candid I, I, I'm people going to turn be. around and broadcast this conversation to thousands, tens of thousands of people, Monica. Tons yeah, no, I know you are. I know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, but somehow, you know what, podcasts are worth, are worth thinking about because this conversation is a powerful one-to-one -one conversation and the internet can't just as easily like take little quotes out of context from podcasts. We all know that. Podcasts allow us to be more candid because it's harder to chop into bits that lose the message, that lose the power. That's why podcasts are becoming so much more popular because people know that there's some kind of candor and truth that is coming out in podcasts that you're just not going to experience anywhere else, um, at least in a public way. And that has a lot to teach so us. The I contained guess. thing is very important because, you know, what is what is like the temptation now in American life is just to turn around and say, hey, I had this conversation with this person mm -hmm. and then put it on social media and it elevates you, particularly if you can. Like, Absolutely. One. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, like, I can't tell you how many times uh, when I was running for the uh, mayor in particular, someone would like run up to me with a cell phone just trying to like, you know, provoke or do something. Yeah. And, and it, like, it really does. You're like, oh my gosh. Like, it, it's a very antagonistic act to just like run up to someone with, 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 with like a vote on. Yeah. And so when you have a conversation with someone, your expectation is like, hey, we're going to talk like humans. And then, right. You know, like, and if I were to say something um, like imperfect, you wouldn't just turn around and be like, oh, this person said, said X and right. Y. So it is a very important principle that you kind of take for granted. Um, in normal life, but now today, like it's harder to take that for granted. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've we've built these we've built these structures on social media where you get a lot of points, right? You get a lot of points for sharing some new outrage. I mean, we know this, and so that's just become oh, it's actually yeah, like infiltrated our normal way of communicating with each other. I get particularly sad when I see you know a neighbor, you know, there, there's something that happened in Everett, Washington some years ago, and I'll, you know, float over the details. But basically, a neighbor went into a, a bakery in, in her town and saw a cookie that had some kind of message on it that really offended her. And so what she chose to do was to put that on social media and talk about how awful it is and how awful the baker, the bakery was. But think about what would have happened if the first thing that woman had done was, was talk to the baker. the baker. Yeah. Talk to the baker. Talk to your neighbor first. Right. And you, you don't know. I mean, it could have 
it became, as you can imagine, this viral national story. I mean, we've seen oh, this over so and sad. over. So that's what it is when we talk about re-knitting ourselves together. It's like, why, why go to the mass of strangers before you go to your neighbor? Why not talk There's to even your neighbor? The social media version of this I will share with you, Monica, which yeah. is very, very irksome. It's like someone that I'm connected to where we've DM'd with each other will like say something on social media and I'm like, dude, you could have just DM'd me. <laughs> exactly, like I'm here. <laughs> you know, you know I mean? and in the case of someone like you, I can kind of understand pe people being like, well, super hard to reach, you know, probably hears from a lot of people. But even then, it's like, you gotta, you gotta try. <laughs> One thing that you can't witness on social media is the act of people listening. So some people are listening like this, you know, and, and judgments and resentments are building but you have, you don't know. They didn't hit like on your post. They didn't comment on it. You, you have no idea. And that's what we're doing is like all these built up resentment. You know, have you ever been on, been on social media and you scroll through and then you stop and you go back to your thing and suddenly you're more stressed out. Like this happened to me oh, so no, many times. Like, like Social media has a negative effect on your state yeah. of mind, uh, you know, eight or nine times. You carry times. that with you. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. back to your point about, well, maybe the, maybe the social media skills workshop is just get off social media, but, but that's not realistic <laughs> because we know all the good that comes out of it. Right. We know that we have to play ball in there. Um, my friend, Angel Eduardo says uh, social media is the boss level of discourse. It is so much more difficult because you're bringing this tiny little carry on, you know, like a tiny little tools of human communication. Well, I have, I have text, the occasional photo and some emojis. And I'm gonna try to, you know, carry my meaning about the hardest issues in, in American life. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> but that's why, you know, pick up the phone, um, you know, on tweet, like, go, okay, can we DM? Anytime that you can, you can raise containment, anytime that you can raise uh, what I call embodiment, you know, the fact that you and I are talking on Zoom, you can see me gesture, you can hear my tone, I can hear yours. It's so much more powerful way to convey our meaning to each other. So again, it's not impossible to do these things on social media, but it takes being able to stuff into words and emojis what we normally need a lot more tools to be able to convey. So you said before that divorce is not an option. And I, I want to, to relay my experience with this notion of like civil war in America. So traditionally, um, conservatives were like, oh, yeah, we might have to have a civil war. And it's like a, a very, very nasty, unwelcome thought. And then people on the left were like, like, of course, you can't have a, you know, like a civil war. And even talking about it is like alarmist, uh, sensationalist, uh, you know, unproductive, destructive, actually. Um, and, and that that has flipped uh, a lot this past year, where a number of books have come out by respected political scientists like Barbara Walter, uh, How Civil Wars Start, uh, Stephen Mars, The Next Civil War. Um, I've looked at the data, and the data suggests strongly to me that we're heading towards some kind of strife or conflict, uh, not like, a, you know, secession, like 13 states are going to vote or any of that, like nothing like that. But folks doing terrible things, uh, in part born of what, what you, you know, said before about being uh, otherized and siloed and sorted uh, and, and the rest of it. Um, so I, I've been making the case that, look, we're heading towards something very, very nasty and negative, not like a political divorce, but we're gravitating towards a societal divorce, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, yeah. or, or like, like people. Yeah. Uh, it's one reason why I think that the, the work you're doing is so important and that I love Braver Angels so much. It, I, I don't know if you'd seen the same switch in thinking among certain people. Yeah, I mean, uh, for all the enthusiasm and positivity, right? A part of me feels like I, I shouldn't say, well, we're kind of already in a civil war, but I think we are. And I don't mean to be alarmist. I, I think it's important to, to think, a lot of people think civil war and think about the 1800s. No, you know, war changes with technology, war changes with cultures. Uh, I studied some political conflict, you know, in, in school and whatever, but like wars are different. And I think that right now, it's, it's largely about media and communication. And yep. in, in that sense, when we have this much misperception across divides, um, the trenches are there. They're not dug into the ground, but they're, they're there. So, so pe you know, we, we keep using this language of we're headed toward what headed toward. And it's like, it's sort of like we don't want to admit, well, in a lot of really meaningful ways, we're already there. With, uh, with Roe v. Wade, you know, my big concern is, wow. I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts. But it, it feels like for the first time in modern history, again, I'm not a historian, so, but it feels like for the first time in modern history, 
we're actually going to have a really big issue divide some you know more red states and some more blue states. It's going to feel a lot more if Roe is overturned and and these states you know pass these laws nope. that it's going to be two countries and people are going to. I mean, how can you not? How could you blame someone for wanting to pick up and move to a different state based on their moral take on an issue that's this tough and, well, and this important? Them personally, you know what I mean. You might be right. Like, hey, my you right. Know, okay. So I'm afraid that the, the I mean, here, here's my fear that I that's not justified with data, but I'm just going to be honest about my fear. My fear is that that there's going to be a domino effect. You know, we do it with abortion. Well, why don't we do it with this and that and the other thing? And then before we know it, there kind of is a red America and a blue America, like for real. At what point, what is the tipping point? When would that become real enough? And I don't think, I don't think that violence has to be part of, a, of this kind of conflict for it to feel like we've just given up on trying to knit back together. That's my fear. I, I've been very, very saddened by the, this. New, and on the, the first people I think of are the women who are going to want to have that kind of choice, uh, who are going to be in red states where the, these rules change uh, that may not have the ability to head to another state uh, and, and uh, do what they want. The pain and anguish, uh, you know, uh, I, I feel is for people like that, who most of whom we'll never hear about or from because they'll be like, uh, you know, like poor, Right. Uh, often uh, of immigrant populations, maybe you don't speak English. Well, you know, like they're, they're going to be yeah. all these the, the, these barriers. Um, that that stuff makes me very very sad. <sighs> it, it feels very sad that the country does seem like we're um, heading backwards, uh, not forward. You know, and and then you have these senators being like, "Hey, these justices lied to me in my office because they said they want to do this, and here we are." Yep. And, and and then you look at that and think, like, "Wow." Like there's really not a whole heck of a lot you can rely on uh, uh, at that point. But you know, <laughs> it's like okay, we've just waded through the muck. But of course, when you when you stay in that muck and you don't see the opportunities, then you know we're, that's where we're really headed south. You know, the reason that I'm not in a place of despair is because I don't think that's the story. You know, thanks to Braver Angels, I've met so many people who completely disagree with me on a lot of issues, including this one, and had amazing conversations, really deep ones, private ones, one-on-ones. Um, and one of them that I had in the fall was actually an, on an episode of the Brave Rangels podcast. And it was two red women who are pro-life and two blue women, including myself, who are pro-choice. And it was so powerful. Uh, and, and we structured it so that we would share our experiences if we were comfortable and we would share our concerns if we were comfortable. And I didn't change my mind overall on things. But I called uh, April Cornfield, who's the head of Brave Angels Debates and is, and is, is red, lean, red, leans red. And I told her, hey, it's been a week or so. And I just need to tell you that I realized something you said has actually shifted my thinking in one way. And I told her what that was. So I, tell, I say all this because you know, the, the battle lines are drawn. It, it does feel like it's an either or with abortion and any other tough issue. But I think that the real tragedy, <laughs> the real tragedy of all this division is that we have so much wisdom and intelligence and competence and capacity if you add everybody up and then put, put us through the filters, you know, the institutions and the, the ways in which they're a bit poisoned right now. And what you get as an output of all that capacity, you know, our capacity is 100, the output is like three. That's the tragedy. There, yeah. there has we're, to, we're, we're there's being, a way to negotiate here. There are ways to come up with creative options. Failed by... Uh, our government, our representative system, our institutions, the media, yeah. the social media, like the, the, the people in our capacity are much, much greater than is being shown. And, and that's really the tragedy. I agree with you. That's, that's it. So, so again, it's like we, we, we get to this place, thanks to the way we tend to talk about these issues, where it really feels like there's no creative solution. There's no best way to balance the tensions and they're never, with something like abortion, it, it is a wicked issue. And like technically a wicked issue is one that you can never resolve for all time. But, but each era has that opportunity to find the best balance for now. And so, you know, the more divided we are and the more that rancor sort of defines everything and we're not even seeing each other clearly to begin with, well, our problem solving capacity is toast. So that, that's the thing to work on is like, there are better ways to make sure that the left and the right, the pro-life and the pro-choice are heard and that the concerns are put on the table 
and that we we strive to do the best for the stakeholders around this issue, primarily, you know, women <laughs> bearing children. So let's do that, right? But but gosh, it feels like 90% of the energy is is on the fight. And and I get it. Like who who can blame anyone, right? The the fight is is so important. But but that's it. I mean, it's just what you said. And and I don't blame, you know, the media and the politicians so much as a system because to me, in, in my experience, when you pluck out a politician, when you pluck out, you know, a journalist in an influential organization, none of them want this. Oh, no, no, no. They're, they're all kind of uh, trapped themselves in this exactly. network and the system. Uh, it's exactly. like this uh, brain uh, of market incentives call, controls us all. And I, you, we have to like put a stake in its heart or, you know, like, uh, I, this is, I called it a brain. You have to like put a nail in the brain. Yeah. Uh, like that's the war that I want us fighting. You know, not like red versus blue, but red and blue versus this. The system, this, 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 this system that's controlling war. us all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's yeah. been the best lesson from my book tour, you know, such as it is and all the interviews and everything is I've been on conservative podcasts, liberal podcasts, libertarian podcasts, politically homeless podcasts. Everyone agrees, you know, that there Everyone ought to agrees. be that we're all empowered to do this. And even in a small scale the you know, the culture will change when we change our behavior, each one of us there's a way to do that. And if we just wait for the systems to figure it out, you know, this is a democracy. We're all implicated in these systems. They are not outside of us. I was at an event years ago. It was um, 2018. I just started my presidential run, but no one had ever heard of me. So when I said, hey, I'm running for president, people would treat me, you know, like I was out of my mind. Anyway, <laughs> uh, there was a woman on stage who said, um, why does it feel like we're just like all heading in a direction that none of us wants, but like none of us mm -hmm. can do anything about it? And I, I think that's the way a lot of people feel is like that there's yeah. like this massive wave of uh, of forces that are, you know, like driving us apart, making us upset at each other, mm -hmm. making it so that the institutional filter leaves us at like 3% of capacity instead of, you know, a, a, a hundred. And everyone's mm -hmm. like, oh, like, you know, <laughs> this everyone, yeah. everyone. And, and, everyone. And so I'm looking at it being like, okay, guys, look, like there are a few ways out of this thing. Uh, and uh, one of them involves breaking free of the duopoly, you know, which would involve a couple of uh, process changes. So open primaries would be super helpful. Ranked yeah. choice voting would be super helpful. Yeah. Multi-party system would be super helpful. So let's do that. It, it, it's been interesting, Monica, because you know, most people, if you present to them, like, hey, here's how we break out of the these manacles and, uh, you know, like, like free ourselves or whatnot, they still don't really see it. Most people, some people do, and I'm grateful. Uh, but what, what it reminds me of is this quote from Upton Sinclair, which is, uh, it's difficult to make a man understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. Right. Yes. Yes. I love that quote. I love that quote. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that is like exactly. a reasonable summary of American life today yeah. is that like there are all these people that are yeah. uh, part of the system, getting paid by the system. And then you're like, hey, you hate the system. System sucks. Like, how about we change it? They're like, eh, no. what, what you're talking about there is empowerment. It's, it's helplessness. It's learned helplessness. It's resignation. It's this idea that, yeah, we're in a democracy, but all we can really do is vote every four years. We only get two choices for president, really. And, you know, and that's that. That's that's where we're at. And, and this disempowerment, I think, is the ultimate monster. Um, and what I've learned, you know, through practicing in local communities is, again, you can build that sense of direct connection uh, right from the from from a small scale and build it up, 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 up. And you get more powerful communities that way. Uh, like what we did at the Evergrey, part of it is language too. You've heard me say neighbor, 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 neighbor. Uh, one of the things we did at the Evergrey was always talk about people as our neighbors. We never did the us versus them. For example, with homelessness, often in the media, it's 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 sort of this language where it's like, well, it's us and it's the homeless. What? 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 You know, our homeless neighbors, our neighbors, they're neighbors. We're all we're all in this together, right? Like. We, we interviewed people who were homeless, not as the object of the problem, but agents in the community. So there's something about that, too, is you, you actually have to work hard and go outside a lot of conventions to make people feel their own power, you know, and their own role that they play. And it's, it's easier to do it locally. Why? Because of embodiment. People can actually get together and shake each other's hands and see each other you know, look at each other's eyes and not hate up close on a national le level. It's almost impossible to build on a national level without doing local first. So this yeah. brings us back, back full circle, right? Local journalism has suffered, tanked tremendously. 
and imagine, imagine a kind of investment, and I don't put this all on local journalism, local community building, local engagement. Um, I just think you have to build those levels first as a foundation, right? And then get to national and pay attention to the whole stack. But again, many of us just kind of skip that step by going here. You know, we go to the national media outlets who have well, I mean, the you, resources. You have, like, and tens of billions of dollars spent on the here, and then the local community is spending exactly. next to here now. And so it's like, yeah. The, the exactly. Oh, by the way, the production values are much better here. Like right. on, the, on this, like the talent level, they'll yeah. cherry pick one of like the best message deliverers in, in the, the country and then have them mm -hmm. and, you know, deck them out and make up and put a nice studio behind them and like mm -hmm. have them, you know, make me feel a certain way. It's like, oh, that, that doesn't I work. know. But you know what? But local can win. Local does win because it has the advantage of proximity and, that, and, and of relationship building and trust building. That, that's, I mean, we talk about the lack of trust. You know, without trust, we can't, we can't have a collective search for truth. You know, we talk about a lack of shared reality. Everyone believes different things. We're not going to be able to build a, a shared reality until we have trust. And trust is built a lot faster and more easily on the ground where we have all the tools, you know, in our box. So anyway, I still, I still am optimistic because I see the path. Well, you're naturally a very optimistic person, but the reason why you're optimistic and the reason why I actually remain optimistic, at least day to day, is because we're actually doing something about it. Yeah, the, 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 feels like, good, right? Like it, it, <laughs> as soon as you're doing something about it, then you're like, oh, I feel better about this because, you know, yeah. can, good things happen. And if you're not doing anything about it, then it's it's very, very difficult to, you know, be yeah. like, oh, it'll be great. <laughs> yeah, like, let's just forget about it. It's making me sad. No, I know, I know. And it's not just, you know, doing something about it. It's also looking around and realizing that there really are a lot of people doing something about this, you know? And, and I think, I, I know it's moving the needle. So we, we can't let this conversation end without talking about family a bit. Do you have a family of your own now? Yes, two kids, nine and seven. Wow, me too. Uh, Same I'm ages? Nine and six, two boys. Oh, ah, no way. So your parents must now be very happy that uh, they're, they're grandparents and all that jazz. Um, so they have no choice but to... Uh... <laughs> oh, they love it. They love it. But uh, you, you talked about how you've had political disagreements uh, with them for, for a long time. Uh, go ahead and give guidance to folks who might have a similar situation uh, in their family where they, they feel like there's this uh, political divide. Yeah. And this is where, you know, my, my inbox has become like a, a confession booth, you know, a place where a lot of people are, are telling me about these stories with family, where there's such strong relationships. One story I can think of uh, that I shared with Brave Angels is a woman named Courtney, who's very purple herself, doesn't consider herself red or blue, but cares deeply about some political issues. And loves her father dearly. And, and there was a, a, a moment where they fought so hard about politics that her father said, that's it. We just can't talk about politics anymore. Oh, no. And so, I mean, that seemed like okay for maybe a bit, but what Courtney realized, and I think a lot of people are realized, is that when, when, when you care deeply about certain issues and, and, and you know, you're very concerned about them, um, then it feels like when you can't talk about politics, you can't even be yourself. And the people you love can't know you or see you. And, and that's the thing that we can't, that, that's no way to live in a way, right? Like if we have these meaningful relationships, what gives them meaning is that we can be our full selves around each other. So that's the conundrum. For a lot of people, the solution is, well, we just don't talk about politics. And maybe that's fine, you know, if it's just Thanksgiving dinners and here and there, and you keep that bridge open, that's fine. But in times like this, when it's just so much more heat and stress, you, you want to be able to do something about it. So among the, 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 the most powerful, I think, things that you can try is we tend to want to engage with each other on the level of logic and syllogism and reason, right? Why do you believe what you believe? How could you possibly believe what you believe? Urgh, you know. But even if you take the, the disrespectful tone out and you leave, why do you believe what you believe? Even then, we think of why as such a powerfully curious question, but in times of division and suspicion, why puts people on the defensive? It, it makes them reach for, uh, what's the talking point? What's the thing that, oh gosh, I better show up well to this relative of mine, or they're going to think less of me, or here we go, I'm being put to the test. It's like you're on trial. You, we're putting each other on trial when we ask why, and everyone has to think of their reason. And, and they won't think of candid reasons usually. You know, They'll just go for what feels safe, because so many people are not even comfortable sharing their political beliefs. So instead, ask questions around how. How did you come to believe what you believe? 
you know, what comes up for you? Like, so dad, I know that you and I disagree hugely about immigration and I'm, I'm really curious, like what, what kind of things have happened, you know, in your life that, that make you, make you think that your position on this is, is, is really important and, and ask it that way. And, and what happens is that the questions naturally carry a lot less judgment. And what you're doing is you're collecting sort of knowledge about that person's path, that person's experience. How um, did you come to this mistaken opinion? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing. You got to peel off the disrespect. <laughs> Keep them curious. People think that every question is curious. Like journalists know better, right? Some questions are just accusations disguised as questions. They're just gotcha. They, they're meant to disqualify people. I put think them I've, in the I've been on the receiving end of some of them. I, I know that you have. <laughs> You know, and sometimes it's in the public good because it's a powerful person, blah, blah, blah. We know that. But with each other on a one-to-one oh, -one relationship level, if we're <laughs> trying to build trust, you know, if we're trying to build trust, then we have to accept, we have to accept each other first, which is the radical thing, and then understand each other and then judge. I mean, what we're doing is we're judging recklessly because we don't even see, we're not even seeing each other clearly. So when we judge, what are we judging? We're judging projections. We're judging ghosts. You know, that's no way to build a society. So yeah, we have to fix that. We have to get each other's stories and have them and invite people to take us on a tour through their path and the concerns and the experiences that make it up uh, instead of put them on trial. Wow. You could yeah. really do a lot of good, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I tell you, there's, there's a woman who left a review of my book on Amazon. It like brought me to tears, but she said that she had not talked to her 85 year old mother who had voted for Trump for years and that she, she read the book and she thought the tips were pretty good. And so she put them to work and she says, you know, she started listening to her mom and asking different kinds of questions. And now she says their relationship is really good. And I, I mean, that made it all worth it. You know? Yeah. That would make everything worth it. That made it all worth it. Yeah. I will share with you that uh, I got, dozens of times over my campaign um like thank you you helped bring our family together because you know like we, you helped uh us feel like we could like agree on something yeah. uh and like that, that was like an incredible blessing to hear i was like wow then, awesome. you know another thing that someone said to me too is like they, they had a um trump supporting mom um and they themselves were were uh blue and then uh, their mom said to them that like Yang is the only Democrat I would support because he doesn't feel like he's judging us at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I was mm -hmm. like, holy cow, like this is probably wow. a very important lesson there. Yeah. You know, we should, and I mean, she's right. Like I, I have zero judgment on um, people based upon their political views. I actually, I actually think I understand yeah. what's driving a lot of what, what's happening in, in, in this country. Yeah. Uh, you, made, you made such an important contribution and you're doing it every day. Um, I, I, but I'm going to wrap on this thought that's been stuck in my head a little bit. I'm going to run it by you and see, see what you think. So it, it feels like the Republican Party under Trump has become this version of sort of angry, toxic masculinity, like the crazy uncle or, 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 or grandpa. And then the Democratic Party has become this um, somewhat like, uh, you know, identity laden uh, moralism that like most people don't feel is genuine. And, and so when you talk about like the, fam the country needing family therapy, like this is an idea that's stuck with me. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think both parties are in this place of confusion and, and panic and a little bit of madness because we all are. Uh, and that, that's what happens, I think, when everything's a funhouse mirror and we're not sure what to do about it. So yeah, the parties are just an extension, the same way that media is an extension and politics politicians, right, their behavior in the conventions, all an extension of, of what we're feeling on the ground and, and what's going on on the ground. Every time I talk with my parents, so they're, they, they're conservative, they voted for Trump twice, um, and I'm liberal. But as I say in the book, I, I've gotten to the point where if I know that if I were them, I would have voted for Trump too. Wow. Duh. That's a very, and, very big thought. And knowing that, yeah, like, it, it's, it's a tough thing to admit, and it took a, a bit to be able to admit it in the book. But getting to the place where I could admit that it was, it was sort of, well, here they are. And here I am now. What it's, it's not, I'm, I need to defeat you. I need to change you. Yes. It's a different question. It's we need to build a society together that somehow yeah. balances uh, the different stacks of values that we have. People think people look across the divide and say, 
they don't share my values, but but actually they do. They just stack them in a different order for different issues. You know, when, when we develop different communities, different communities develop different languages. And over time, if they don't inter interact that well, it's a tower of Babel, you know? And, and that's what's happening too. So that's only adding to the panic and the frustration and the madness. So we, we need some of these, uh, you know, it counter things. But again, I've, I've talked to members of Congress, you know, one-on-one, -on, -one, on background, people want to fix this. And, and I, for one, am, am really encouraged by the work a lot of politicians are doing, um, including yourself. Just anyone who's really tackling this beast instead of just accepting the game as it is, we need that. That's what we need. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's tame this beast or slay this beast. Mm -hmm. Monica, uh, congratulations. The book is awesome. I never thought of it that way. How to have fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. Best of luck in the rest of your book tour. Keep bringing people together. Uh, and you are you really are a national treasure. Jeez, like you know, mm. like I, oh. I feel like if we could get you in front of enough people, we really would have a chance at this thing. I know there's hope. I know we can do it, and I know we can work together. To, to get some if, real if, miracles if, done. You're going to be a big reason why, my friend. <laughs> Congratulations on this. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew.